attention one is Chinese aggression. China selectively interprets impulse in its favor, which differs from the U.S. interpretation as Nye of the Belfort Center in 2015 writes the U.S. argues that impulse grants free access to the sea beyond a 12-mile limit, while China claims ships cannot cross its 200-mile economic zone without permission. If China claims such a zone for each of the sites it occupies, it could close off the South China Sea. U.S. accession to impulse legitimizes and intensifies those disagreements over interpretation as U.S. sign of conflict becomes a hegemonic struggle. Blumenthal, the AEI in 2012, explains U.S. ratification of UNCLOS won't resolve China-U.S. disagreements. It will only lead to China's legal and diplomatic wrangling, which would intensify tensions. Navarro in 2016 writes, China believes they should dominate the South China Sea and control all waters off their coastline. And if the United States tries to form a balancing coalition in Asia to prevent Chinese domination of Asia, it will cause an intense security competition between the U.S. and China. Increased tensions between China and the U.S. creates a security dilemma. Blumenthal continues, UNCLOS is unclear as to what military activities are allowed in a country's EEZ, meaning that there is no easy institutional answer to this interpretation dispute. Erickson 09 corroborates increasing uncertainty only incentivizes one nation to attack out of misunderstanding, mistakenly believing they can win a nuclear war, or thinking they are about to be attacked, which increases the chance of miscalculation. Erickson continues that mutually assured destruction works best when the choices are clear and concise. This means that UNCLOS undermines deterrence. Mitchell of the University of Iowa in 2008 corroborates a military conflict is twice as likely for countries in UNCLOS. The impact is war. Gomper of Rand in 2016 states war between the two countries could begin with devastating strikes, last months if not years, have no winner, and inflict huge losses on both sides of military forces. Farley of national interest in 2017 concludes a war between China and America would be a world war and millions would die. Contention 2 is saving Santa. The Arctic is full of oil reserves that are very profitable for companies. Pedroza of the Naval War College in 2013 explains that Arctic provinces, which could be claimed by the United States, account for 248 billion cubic feet of natural gas and 94 million barrels of oil and oil equivalent natural gas. Gray of the National Defense University in 2013 corroborates that for the United States, Arctic drilling can produce billions, perhaps trillions of dollars in profits from oil, natural gas, and minerals. Montgomery in 2017 explains that because of rapid innovation, firms can make money at prices as low as $40 per barrel, meaning that without restrictions, companies would be economically incentivized to drill in the Arctic. Despite potential profits, lack of certainty regarding the legal status of Arctic claims prevents U.S. companies from investing and participating in Arctic drilling, something that would change if the U.S. acceded to UNCLOS. Nevitt of the NYU School of Law in 2017 explains that UNCLOS provides the legal architecture for competing continental shelf claims, and because the United States has not ratified the treaty, they cannot file claims to borders in the Arctic. Gardner of the American Security Project in 2012 writes that territorial challenges remain ease, especially to United States interests, and without the necessary permits to drill, companies would face international legal challenges that would disrupt drilling activities and potentially cause massive investments to go to waste. This is why Gardner continues companies won't drill in the Arctic until they are backed by the legal framework of UNCLOS and bilateral treaties won't cut it. This also disincentivizes investment in Arctic drilling as Gray corroborates lack of legal certainty unnecessarily clouds investment motivation, concluding no U.S. company will make the $1 billion investments required to recover these resources without the legal certainty the convention provides. The impact is emissions. Walsh of Time in 2012 writes methane and black carbon, two potent greenhouse gases, will be emitted in significant amounts of drilling in the Arctic occurs. The Wilderness Society in 2015 explains methane emissions trap heat very effectively, and the environmental impact of methane is 34 times greater than carbon dioxide. White Men of Nature in 2013 quantifies extra methane magnifies flooding of low-lying areas, extreme heat stress, droughts, and storms, increasing climate change impacts by 45%, and amounting to 15% of the total amount of climate damage. Whiteman continues 80% of environmental damage will occur in the poor economies of Africa, Asia, and South America, regions where any disaster is devastating and recovery is much more difficult. Franchini of the IRPH in 2017 corroborates air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million deaths every year. Carrington in 2015 concludes Arctic drilling would push the world beyond the two degree mark and past the point of no return for climate change, thus we negate.
We affirm that the United States should accede to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or move closer to shore without reservations. Contention one is the PSI. The Proliferation Security Initiative, or PSI, is a US-led effort of more than 100 countries to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs. PSI has a proven track record. Belcher of the CFR finds that up to 2011, the PSI was credited with more than two dozen interdictions of WMD-related technology. <coughs> However, the need for interdiction is ever-growing. The National Institute for Public Policy explains that it is only a matter of time before prol proliferating states acquire WMDs. Fortunately, a session to UNCLO strengthens the PSI by increasing multilateral cooperation. Even though more than 100 nations already participate in the PSI, the NIPP concludes that there are important countries in Africa and Asia near busy maritime straits that remain out of the PSI because of legality issues surrounding PSI interdictions under UNCLOS. Vineco of the Naval War College explains that although many countries would like to join the PSI, they can't convince their legislators that the PSI is in accordance with the UNCLOS when the leading PSI nation, the US, has not yet signed the treaty. Ultimately, just one stop nuke is enough to prevent proliferation. For example, David Simon of Air University explains that after the PSI allowed uh, the discovery of Libya's nuclear weapons program, the U.S. was able to press Gaddafi to end his WMD program. In other words, the PSI allows the U.S. to discover WMD programs, leading to coercive measures such as sanctions against Iran or Libya. The impact is regime entrenchment. According to Matthew Sebel of Harvard uh, Haverford College in 2013, isolationist dictators that privilege state control are more willing to begin weapons programs. Obtaining WMDs helps dictators to abuse citizens without fear of international reciprocations. Indeed, France 17 of Global Politics and Strategy explicates, leaders espouse more anti-Western rhetoric, mismanage foreign aid, and obliterate domestic institutions in a way that make it more difficult to establish democracy. Contention two is strengthening in close. There are two reasons why U.S. accession was strengthened in close, and the first is legitimizing the U.S.'s interpretation. According to Azuma of the ASP, while the U.S. correctly interprets UNCLOS as a means of maintaining order at sea, China has exploited it as a means to restrict maritime freedom and expand its own interests. However, Hashkin of the Center for American Progress finds that many states are beginning to lean towards China's interpretation of UNCLOS and that at least one-third of UNCLOS members are in breach of significant provisions in the law of the sea. This is because the U.S. has not acceded to UNCLOS. The toll of the NJS in 2012 explains that China has been able to paint the American interpretation as self-serving and disingenuous because while China has officially signed UNCLOS, the U.S. tries to subject other countries to its interpretation, yet refuses to sign on itself. Thus, to bring legitimacy to its interpretation of UNCLOS, the toll argues that the U.S. must accede. Preventing China's interpretation is crucial because Oruk of the CRS concludes in 2014 that it would set a precedent to challenge UNCLOS mechanisms worldwide. The second reason is international clout. Because the US is the most powerful and influential country worldwide, joining UNCLOS would encourage other countries to see UNCLOS as more legitimate. This is confirmed by Corey Bloomberg, who explains in July that the US is the linchpin of institutions such as the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, and NATO. For these two reasons, Smith 17 of the Marine Policy Journal writes that while UNCLOS is dangerously close to deterioration, US accession would bring legitimacy back to the agreement. This is important because Gate 17 of the University of Chicago writes that without the shared framework of UNCLOS, countries would turn towards their military to solve disputes. Indeed, Mitchell of the University of Iowa finds that UNCLOS reduces new maritime conflicts by five times. Thus, we affirm. Say, like, 
So like, first of all, what is the probability that like, um, like there's going to be a new like universe? high because that's what happened like three times in the past? No, wait. You need to okay. First of all, you need to show me the evidence that specifically because countries were not following the like redraft rule. I said I would say. Secondly, be, like the specific the circumstances are very specific right now, right? Because China is pushing towards its own interpretation. I would say instead of revising a new like revising a new impose, what China wants to do is completely change the impose to benefit itself. I'd say that's not a really good reinterpretation of the impose. But can I ask you? I think the US can be part of negotiations, sure. But the United States is not being Right. In nineteen ninety four they were not part of UNCLOS, but they yeah. still negotiated. Right. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So let's talk about your first contention, right? So you say that like mutually assured destruction only happens when like choices are like clear and concise. So why does ratifying or why does the U.S. acceding to impose make these choices of like whether to go to war or not less clear okay. and less concise? Right. So basically, what happens when the United States accedes is they try to check back on China's hegemony with like legitimacy and multilateralism. This is a bad thing because China's just going to feel even more threatened by the United States' actions in the South China Sea because right now they just have these peaceful operations going on. However, when the U.S. is trying to push back on China. China cannot interpret what the United States like actions in the South China Sea mean, which is why the like United States actions get complicated for China and why they like yeah. The but like, like the happens. problem is like your impact is war, right? Or like some yeah. kind of conflict. Like mm -hmm. why does the why does like China's interpretation okay. of how the U.S. like is aggressing in the South China Sea? Right. So why does like, that no hang on. Like why does that affect like whether they say oh should we start war or not? So it's like if they think that the United States is about to attack them, they would attack first instead. So like do you think war is in China's best interest right now? Uh, no, but avoiding a war with like the United States would definitely be in their best interest. They're so not like, just gonna okay if they view the United States' actions as threatening, they're not just gonna wait until the United States strikes them first. They're gonna strike instead. But I got But is war in China's best interests? I mean, I'd say war is like technically never in people's best interest, but war has definitely happened in the like, past because people's national security, like country's national security, has been threatened. Can yeah, I get yeah, a yeah. question? Wait, hang on, like, hang on, like one last question. So, like, why does signing onto UNCLOS make China think that the U.S. is going to attack them militarily? Because um, they, it like legitimizes the United States' check on their hegemony and the multilateral coalition is pushing back China. I get a question. Yeah. So you talk about these PSI countries and how, like, even though we have 100, we still need more. Can you name any specific countries that we like need to add to PSI? Like for example, in the South China Sea, Malaysia. Like, Didn't Malaysia join in 2014? Like a lot. Okay, like we can show you the card after. Like sure. very clearly, like a lot of straits need these countries to join the PSI to stop nuclear proliferation. and 
international legal backing so that they can act so they can actually get like their domestic law to like follow it. But then um, we would also say like you can delink it again because PSI is already legal under the United Nations Security Council resolutions and the right to self-defense, which means like again they already have the international backing in order to actually like join PSI. And they can't actually give you and like third, we would say they don't actually give you any examples of which countries are crucial to joining PSI to make PSI efforts successful, which means that like they don't actually have any bright line or uniqueness here as to what countries would join if the United States did and what these countries would actually contribute to PSI. The only example they give is Malaysia, but Malaysia joined PSI in 2014 without the United States being acceded to UNCLOS. And then on their second contention about UNCLOS collapse, a couple of really big problems with this. You can group both of their warrants for now because first, it's non-unique. We would say that right now China, the only example they give, has been increasing their hegemony and violating UNCLOS for decades. And this is really critical because right because UNCLOS hasn't been declining. Like if, if their warrant was true, then we would have already hit the bright line and UNCLOS would have already collapsed. But obviously that hasn't happened and they don't actually give you any impacts saying that it's like a linear decrease in UNCLOS because if that was true, then all of their impacts would be happening at least in part. But that contextualization doesn't exist in their case. And second, we would turn it with the Navarro analysis because Navarro specifically says that when the United States is legitimizing themselves at the international level, they're containing China and stopping their hegemonic expansion. And this is critical because it creates the security dilemma, which then means that China is afraid that the United States is going to preemptively strike, which is why they strike first. We would tell you that this miscalc scenario is a much more direct link into the US and China getting into a conflict, and that would probably collapse unclose a lot faster. And then we would also, like the third response is that empirically, China doesn't even listen to the international community. You can look to examples such as the Philippines ruling in 2016 when the international community told China to stop like infringing upon the Philippines territory. China didn't listen. You can also look to the fact that right now China is building artificial islands in the South China Sea and the entire international community, 160 countries, have already told them to stop doing this, which A, and there's two implications here. The first is that the international community is already going against China, meaning you don't need the United States join, but B, even if the United States did join, this doesn't actually mean China would listen. There's no legitimization uniquely in an app world. You can turn it, the fourth response is another turn, because multilateralism that they're linking through also takes away all hope of negotiations with China, because DS and Forbes explains that China's negotiations involve a divide and conquer strategy of refusing to negotiate with countries and groups, but only negotiating with international countries, and they're undercutting their own impacts here, because even if the countries are banding against China and trying to tell China to like stop violating UNCLOS, they have a lot less success, specifically in an app world where multilateralism happens. But then, on their internal link with their Smith evidence, we would tell you it's definitely not true, because in the past, when UNCLOS has started deteriorating, for example, in 1982, in 1994, and in the 1950s, what hasn't happened is a collapse, but what has happened is that it's been renegotiated, and this is really critical, because in the in 1994, the United States actually helped renegotiate UNCLOS without signing on to it, which means that they can legitimize without joining it, so you don't need to affirm and risk all of the harms to in order to actually legitimize UNCLOS. But then, on their impact level, first of all, there's literally no terminalization on what turning to military conflict means. We don't know that this will A, actually cause war, or B, what these wars would even look like and how many people they'd affect. to the 164 other countries that are inside of UNCLOS. Second of all, she said that China is going to get, uh, get really mad if the United States gets legitimized, and then China is going to declare war. Yes, UNCLOS is going to legitimize, lead to legitimacy, and if the United States was really, really aggressive, there would be war. But these two things are very, very far apart. UNCLOS is not going to lead to war. Third of all, she says that China, uh, that 160 countries disagree with China's interpretation. So, even if countries disagree with China's interpretation, that is not our argument. Our argument is that China is setting a precedent that you can violate UNCLOS with zero repercussions, so even if those countries disagree with China's repercussions, they still see that they can uh, violate in other ways. Then they say that 
China has been able to do a divide and conquer strategy. But this has nothing to do with the legitimacy of inclus. We are saying the United States increases the legitimacy of inclus, and lastly, she says that they just renegotiate inclus. Two responses here. First of all, in 1958, we re renegotiated inclus not because it was collapsing. They read you no evidence. The reason why we renegotiated is because we thought we wanted another treaty. But then second of all, the geopolitical circumstances are a lot different. In 1958, the United States was a kid considered the leader of the liberal or world order. The difference now is that China is now hedging against us. They're expanding their economic power. And we tell you with the hatching and evidence that China is looking very, very legitimate. The reason why our second contention, which I fully frontline, outweighs their entire case is because if there is no UNCLS, which we tell you is deteriorating in status quo, then there is no legal framework in the Arctic. There is no one that can actually uh, solve back for these Arctic drones. So if there's no legal framework, everyone is going to be rushing to the Arctic, which means drilling is going to happen in their either world. In their world, in fact, it gets a lot worse. Let's go to their contention, one on China. The first thing that they tell you is that there's going to be endless legal, legal wrangling. Actually, the United States and China are already doing endless legal wrangling, wrangling outside of UNCLOS. They don't tell you why UNCLOS is specifically bad. But then second of all, UNCLOS is the only way to stop this endless legal wrangling. The reason why is because tribunals essentially rule in UNCLOS and they say you are right and they are wrong. The reason why this is important is the only way to determine who is right and who is wrong is to have this tribunal, but we can't have this tribunal if the United States is not part of UNCLOS. Then they say there's no easy answer. The thing is the East Asian Forum finds that the vast majority of countries say, uh, like 100 countries out of 165, to the United States is correct. So if there's ultimately comes to the ruling and the ruling of the judges come from different countries, they're going to rule for the United States. Lastly, there's no chance that there's going to be a war. The Mitchell evidence comes from 2008, but Mitchell came out in 2015 and made a new study, and she actually found that UNCLOS decreases uh, conflicts by five times. The reason why is because it creates a shared legal framework. Let's go to their contention to an Arctic drilling. So, the first issue here is according to the Heritage Foundation, the United States has already implemented this through bilateral treaties. We have treaties with Russia, we have treaties with Canada. They say that companies say that bilateral treaties aren't enough. However, you can look to the Gulf of Mexico, which the growth of growth of Heritage Foundation finds is that we're already drilling there in our extended continental shelf with bilateral treaties, which ultimately means empirically in the real world, it's true. The reason why companies are saying that they need to accession to UCLOS is that they're inherently, inherently ca uh, capitalist. Acceding to UCLOS is going to give them some sort of benefit, but that doesn't mean that without UCLOS they're not going to see. The reason why they're not drilling in the status quo is because it's not profitable. But then second of all, according to the Brookings Institution, the vast majority of oil, 90% lies within the United States exclusive economic zone. The reason why this is important is the vast majority of oil is still going to be drilled. Their impacts are going to manifest in either one. And on top of that, the United States only owns one fifth of the Arctic. And on top of that, it's unlikely that we're only even going to draw out all the oil in our exclusive economic zone, which means their impact is probably very, very not unique. And then third of all, according to O'Sullivan of Foreign Policy in 2017, if we do not uh, essentially Russia sees the Arctic as a really great way to expand their hege hegemonical power. So if the United States just leaves the oil out for like 30 years and they never touch it, essentially Russia's economy is dependent on oil. So if we don't go there and we show zero interest, Russia is going to drill. And Russia is comparatively worse than the United States. And the reason why this is true is because number one, they're dependent on the economy, on the, dependent on the oil, they're gonna drill a lot faster. But number two, they don't have the same time, same kind of environmental regulations. Lastly, according to Grammar 17 of foreign policy, the Arctic oil costs two times as much to drill as any other region, the next, next most expensive region. The reason why this is important is because countries have a, uh, companies have a finite amount of money they can invest. They can't just spam the oil drills everywhere. So if they want to build like five new oil drills, they're never going to put a single one in the Arctic. It's coming a long, long way off. I would say that the impacts of climate change are already going to manifest. This argument is very, very untrue. Yeah.
So if they were doing that, then don't the geo, like isn't the geopolitical condition in 1994 essentially the same as it is now because China's still expanding their hegemony. But if the US was already like still able to renegotiate the treaty, like why do any of your 1958 responses even apply? So here's the reason. First of all, in 1994, China still wasn't as, as good at uh, challenging our hegemony in the South China Sea as they are today. So that is how they're just able to legitimize their uh, power. But then second of all, the first year that China violates UNCLOS and no one is following China's uh, the, like, precedent of following UNCLOS does not mean that UNCLOS is going to collapse. Our argument is after 30 years of violating UNCLOS, other countries are seeing that China is able to violate UNCLOS and they're going to violate UNCLOS. The reason why the United States obsession solves is not because we stop China. It is because China right now is able to paint the United States as an imperialist power, which we don't respond to, and because we're basically telling China to stop and we're outside of UNCLOS. So if we accede to UNCLOS, other countries are able to look at our intervention as more valid because we aren't signed Do you have a question? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about your contention one on uh, like endless legal wrangling. So, can you just make clear to me, like, what is going to happen? What is the difference in being close that makes it so that war is going to be so likely? I mean, you, like, really mishandle it. Like, you say that it's just, like, legal wrangling. That's not necessarily what it is. We say that when the United States joins UNCLOS, they're legitimized, which is why other countries would start following them multilaterally. But the Navarro evidence is extremely explicit. It says that when this happens, China gets the symbol that the United States is trying to contain them in the South China Sea. And because all China cares about is expanding their hegemony, like you yourself say, this is what causes them to lash out, which is how we link into the mishelp scenario from happening. Wait, wait, here's the issue, right? So, like, first of all, this concedes our second contention because it says there's an increase in legitimacy. No, you just say China doesn't listen. Like, just because no, 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 you're no, increasing wait, legitimacy. I, I give you your minute. So, I, what I'm saying is that the United States, you just told me that it increases the United States' legitimacy for our interpretation. So, I would say that it concedes our thing. But, no, I would say, wait. The reason that it's, no, let me respond here. What we tell you is, like, the multilateralism, it's not going to actually make China stop, but it is going to send the signal that the United States is trying to stop China from expanding. Wait, so China our gets argument. Mad. Our argument is not stopping China. Our argument is telling the 164 argument. other countries to stop. But, let's talk about this China. So sure. China thinks that the United States, let's say somehow China thinks that the United States is all of a sudden, like, really dedicated to stopping China, even though we do tons of military skills in the status quo. How is that close to new war? So I agree that tensions might increase like because one or two percent. Because specifically, well, why that when the war? United States is getting all of these countries in the Asia Pacific to go against China, this is showing that they are trying to push China inward. Right now, even if the U.S. is conducting like phone ops, they're not actually trying to push China inward because they're still allowing China to expand. The containment uniquely happens in an app world.
investments without that, they can still get sued and still get kicked off, which means that their investments are just going to go to waste, which is why they, Gardner concludes that they specifically need international legal certainty through UNCLOS. And then they try to tell you that 90% of oil is in, the, is in the ECS. Yes, we're telling you that the United States is going to go and drill in the ECS specifically, and the only way that they can get claims to their ECS is by ratifying UNCLOS so that they can actually go through the Arctic Council and get those. And then they try to tell you that like, Russia is going to drill, so it's non-unique. However, Putin tells you in 2018 that Russia is not going to drill because they do not have the tech, and sanctions mean that they're not, not they're not going to have the tech, which means that this, their like, impacts are never going to happen here. And then they try to tell you that Arctic oil is going to cost a lot to drill. However, Henderson tells you that within the next 12 months, oil prices are going to reach $200 a barrel, which means that it's going to be profitable. And Montgomery from Case tells you that you only need to, that oil prices only need to be $40 a, a barrel in order to be profitable, which means that companies are going to drill. That's why Gray terminalizes that there's tr trillions of dollars of profit in the Arctic, and that's why White tells you there's going to be a 45% increase in the impacts of climate change in their world. We're out waiting here for a few reasons. First on scope, because when Carrington says that we're going to push the, wor the world past the point of no return when, when drilling happens, this means that we're killing billions of people over multiple generations in their world. That we're out waiting there. But then go to their case. Remember, first of all, that they, like, that in the past, when UNCLOS has been deteriorating, they just renegotiated. They tried to like cite this 19, 1958 case. However, remember in 1994, the United States literally re renegotiated it, and they weren't even part of UNCLOS. They still got their hands. But even then, there's absolutely no break. China has not been listening to UNCLOS for a very long time. Their impacts haven't happened. They're not going to happen. Starting on oil, and then I'll talk about like all the other stuff. All the other stuff. Mm -hmm. <coughs> good? Okay. Let's start off with oil. They severely mishandled the Brookings, the second response to Josh was in the rebuttal when the Brookings instituted. They tried to frame it as the ECS, which is the extended continental shelf. What's really important is the Brookings evidence, evidence is talking about the extended econo exclusive economic zone. This is really important because in the status quo, without ratifying moon clause, the U US had actually claims to the EU. That means that they should be drilling right now. There's only 10% of the oil in the ECS, which they do not have claims for. That takes out all their offense because there's absolutely no incentive for U.S. oil companies to go into the Arctic to drill 10% of the oil they have in the Arctic. That is not in their EEZ. But now, secondly, you can also turn it from the Oslo evidence, which is Josh's third response. They say that uh, he says that basically Russia will take over if uh, the U.S. doesn't go in right now. That Russia is a lot worse at drilling because they have a lot less environmental regulations. That overall actually makes their impact even worse. But now let's go into our second contention about strengthening English. This is, we need to clear this up, right? Because they're trying to paint this as like, like solving for China. But we are talking about solving for the, uh, for the one third of countries that are actually in breach of the provisions of the UNCLOS. That comes from Hashigan, that comes from Hashigan on our uh, first warrant. This is really important because at the end of the day, nobody is going to completely solve for China's aggression. But what we do is we have a risk of solvency for actually legitimizing the, legitimizing the US's interpretation of UNCLOS, which takes away China's power in the South China Sea. This comes from Detol, who says that basically right now, because the US is not signed on to UNCLOS, China can paint the US as a really hip hypocritical nation because they aren't signed on. However, once the US does sign on, that signals to the other nations that, hey, US is actually, US's interpretation is correct because we have signed on. This is really important for a few reasons. 
First, we prerequisite their oil response because I would say at the end of the day, if there's no legal framework for the law. There's no legal framework for the seas. That means that any company, any nation could go into the Arctic and drill. That's really bad because the, that increase that makes all of their impacts even worse. But second of all, at the bottom of our case for Mitchell, UNCLOS uh, reduces maritime conflicts by five times. That's really important because that impacts uh, that impacts even more scope than they do. Because at, while we are solving for conflict on the maritime seas, that's really important because we we solve the conflicts. We don't actually 
actually, we don't have the claim in the status quo. You still need unclose, but then also, right now, the companies, the Gardner says that the companies have specifically said that they need unclose legal certainty because they know that if they don't have it, then the other countries would have a competing claim and sue them, and then they might get kicked out, which is why they can't make the investments unless they have the legal certainty. They also tell us that Russia's drilling, but they're non-responsive to the Pritchett analysis, which says that because we've sanctioned Russia, that means that Russia does not have the technology right now to actually drill in the Arctic, and they've halted all of their operations. Then they say that, and then, like, we have for a couple of reasons. The first is on scope, because Carrington tells you that once we have Arctic drilling, you push us past the brink for climate change, which means billions of people are going to die in the long run over generations. But second, we have probability, because there's no actual bright line to unclose collapse happening. It hasn't happened in the past, even though the violations have been going on for decades, but drilling happens right now, and this is 100% certain. But then, um, third, we have time frame, because collapse might take decades because they have no bright line, but we would tell you that the drilling impacts, once they happen, push us past the brink, which means people are going to be dying immediately when you affirm. But then, on unclosed collapse, they don't extend an impact in summary. You can drop that contention right there. But also, we would tell you in the past, in 1994, the U.S. renegotiated unclosed without being a part of it, but then also, China hasn't been listening to unclosed for decades, meaning that if the deterioration has actually been happening, we should already be seeing some of their impacts happening, but we haven't, meaning that it's not a linear impact and there's no bright line. You always vote net. our exclusive economic zone, even as a non-party. 90% of it is there. But on top of that, we tell you that it's unlikely that we're even going to take out all of that oil. The reason why this is important is it's essentially terminal defense. We are going to get that oil in either world when it's profitable, which means that they have no offense in this round. Even if we solve one maritime conflict extra, we, have, we are going to be winning this round. Let's go to our case. They extend a couple of responses. So, first in terms of weighing, they say there's no bright line into where, when it's going to happen, and they also say there's like a time frame argument that it's going to be, like, they, we don't know when it's going to collapse. We tell you it is on the brink of collapse after 30 years of Chinese uh, aggression. Second of all, they say that they're, going to, they're just going to renegotiate. No, they're not going to renegotiate for two reasons. First of all, we were able to renegotiate in 1994 because they, the close wasn't collapsing. We just thought we wanted a new one. So all these countries came together and said we want a new one. They don't even read you a single piece of evidence that those ones were collapsing. But then second of all, the fundamental difference today is that there is China in the equation. And China has been able to delegitimize the United States' interpre interpretation of the maritime law. We tell you that one third of countries are now violating and countries that more and more are buying into China's interpretation. That lastly, they bring up a new response that we say there is no there, we give you zero indication that the close is collapsing. We tell you that there's plenty of examples, like for example, one third countries are moving towards China uh, interpretation, etc. Et so. The reason, uh, the link we are going to explain is our first link. We tell you that China is able to paint the United States as a hypocritical actor if they're not acceded to the close, even though we're trying to enforce the correct interpretation. So China is able to legitimize it, a strategy of uh, non-violent to the close. But the totally evidence tells you if the United States uh, accedes, we are able to push our own evidence, uh, push our own interpretation. The Smith evidence tells you that the is dangerously close to deterioration, but U.S. accession specifically brings that legitimacy back. That is our bright line evidence. So. They say that we don't extend, an, uh, extend a, an impact. We don't need to extend an impact because the prerequisite way that they don't respond to you a single time. This is enough to win us the round. If there isn't any legal framework in the Arctic, then everyone is, there's going to be no way you can actually see these companies. Everyone is going to be rushing to the Arctic. The Arctic drilling is going to be faster. It's going to be messier. There's going to be a lot more spills. This is the easiest way to vote for the affirmative side. <laughs> 